Hello? Yeah, great. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's keynote speaker, Professor Danica Krajic from uh, Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, Sweden. Um, Danica is also a Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, a member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, and she received the IEEE Robotics Automation Society Early Career Award. Her research is at the intersection of computer vision, robotics, and machine learning, and with a, specifically focused on perceptive grasping. And she's also the general chair of the next year's International, IEEE International Conference on Robotics Automation in Sweden. So let's welcome Danica. Thank you, Jing. So um, I wasn't here yesterday, I just arrived um, to welcome you all to um, Stockholm. So um, I use this opportunity now to invite you all to Stockholm next year and uh, ICRA. Uh, and hopefully we'll uh, make even better conferences, uh, if, if possible. Okay, I changed a little bit the title of my uh, talk. Um, it uh, analysis seeing, caging, grasping, uh, but I change it to perceiving because um, um, in the work that we do uh, in relation to caging and grasping, we don't use only vision but also tactile, haptic feedback and also proprioception, so um, that's why the change. Um, so since I arrived very late, um, I also um, missed the whole Amazon picking challenge which, uh, which me and my students understood as Amazon grasping challenge, um, given um, the topics that have been described. So um, object recognition, pose recognition, grasp planning, compliant manipulation, and so on. But as I heard, it was only a handful of teams that actually did grasping. Um, and there were some other innovative solutions of how to do object interaction. So um, our work at KTH has, uh, for quite some time, addressed the problem of um, object interaction, where we then think about a um, number of different uh, types of interactions. And uh, I have a um, couple of examples here. So, um, um, so just to be clear, for, for the record, this is a human and not a robot uh, doing the dishes. Because as far as I know, no robots can yet do actually um, the dishes and uh, some humans neither. Uh, well, um, when we talk about interaction with objects uh, in general, we don't talk only about grasping, but we talk about very skilled and advanced um, uh, activities that are actually, uh, uh, that actually have also a certain length and require pretty advanced uh, sensory capabilities. So um, I don't know if you ever think about how complex it is to actually cut bread. And in Sweden, we have very many different uh, types of bread of different, uh, 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 well, with of different properties. And it does require pretty skillful feedback in terms of haptics in order to be able to understand how to incline the knife and what type of force to use in order to uh, uh, do a type of activity such as this one. Other types of interactions um, also uh, do not involve only grasping, but of course also planning. And there has been uh, some work on so-called grasp pre-manipulation, pre so how to prepare an object or bring it in a position from which it can be safely grasped. Um, and the part then from uh, doing uh, object manipulation uh, in terms of uh, only using arms and hands, advanced object manipulation, especially in collaboration with humans, also require full body planning. So these are some of the things we are interested in. So. Um, Scientific questions that we have been addressing uh, is the modeling of multisensory perception and object representation for tasks like this. And uh, things that we are 
uh, currently working on uh, and interested in is caging in 3D, and I'm going to motivate this a little bit more by caging. Um, caging can uh, allow us to do so-called loose interactions with objects, so allow us more rich interaction where we do not uh, uh, completely close or uh, make the object completely static in the hand. Uh, however, there is uh, still an open problem uh, how to show that we have safe cages in 3D. And the third problem that I would like to talk uh, a little bit uh, about today is in-hand grasp adaptation. So after a robot has grasped something, uh, how it can A, um, um, achieve a better grasp, more stable grasp, or how it can do re-grasping or in-hand grasp adaptation in order to um, uh, address, for example, external disturbances of different types. Uh, we have for, for a very long time been interested in task-dependent grasping. So how do robots grasp things so that they can actually achieve a subsequent task? Uh, thinking about robots bring me something to drink or robot bring me something to drink from require a very different um, types of tasks to be, uh, 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 to be achieved. Uh, this is just one example of a system that we have developed for such a purpose, and uh, I have put it in one slide just to show that uh, it's not a simple thing. If you just want to grasp, put fingers around the object, that's one thing. But if you also want to reason about how to grasp something in order to do something with it, and also rely on a um, sensory feedback, realistic sensory feedback work with scenes that uh, include multiple objects, then things become uh, more complex. So in this example, uh, uh, this is a system that encodes uh, different types of grasps on various categories of objects and uh, also processes uh, rather complex scenes. So what you can see here is a scene filled with a number of different objects and when given a task, robot bring me something to drink, uh, the robot reasons uh, through the use of Bayesian net, probabilistic model, uh, what objects actually afford drinking. So it also integrates the notion of affordances. So why build these complex systems? I suppose that uh, the result of the Amazon challenge can also be uh, one example. So uh, not maybe developing just uh, heuristic uh, solutions to solve very specific problems, but look into the generality. So how do we build systems that can reason about uh, scenes, objects that, they these, that these scenes contain, and can also use this for transfer the knowledge. So to use the knowledge the system already has about grasping a certain type of object and then transfer that knowledge to completely new object. So these are just a couple of references where um, uh, we uh, published and um, uh, the work in this uh, direction. So it's looking into how we can develop systems that can in an integrated manner address the problems of action recognition, task-based planning, and grasp stability assessment. So just to give you a little bit of an idea of how the system works. So let's say that uh, uh, the robot is supposed to uh, grasp a detergent bottle in order to be able to uh, pour a detergent from, from the bottle. So what you see uh, on the bottom is a probabilistic uh, uh, model that defines what approach factors or what types of grasps are relevant for that specific task, which is pouring. So in this case, the robot would not choose a grasp from the top because it uh, obstructs the lid, but it would be then grasping from the side. Now the interesting thing of the system is that the system can predict whether a specific grasp will be stable under different types of manipulations or not. So the example just showed that the grasp was predicted as unstable and it was tested and showed to be unstable. And uh, the grasp are grasps are planned then on integrated uh, visual and haptic feedback, so we use the tactile sensors from the fingers in order to assess the stability of the grasp once the object has been grasped. So the, 
the idea of the system is to integrate uh, prior knowledge, so what we know about the shape of the object, the, the weight of the object, together with the information that can be extracted online, so the contact information uh, and the weight. Uh, so um, that allows us then to build systems that can reason more about, uh, let's say, not only uh, a single grasp, but a multitude of grasps, and also adapt the grasp based on the information that is available once the grasp has been um, uh, 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 generated or achieved. Another thing that um, I would like to mention is also our work on so-called grasp moduli spaces. So for quite some time we have been thinking about whether there is a way of modeling the space of shapes of objects in the grasps that can be applied on those in an integrated manner. Uh, why would one like to do that? Well, if we can find or learn a space of these integrated shapes and grasps, we can maybe find a way of how to vary that space so that we can transfer uh, or find, learn, uh, different grasps on, on the same type of objects or generate um, uh, 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 same grasp of different types of objects and so on. So grass moduli spaces, uh, as we suggest, is a space uh, that is combined grass and shape space. It has the ability to deform continuously between different types of configurations, and here we talk about uh, three-fingered grasp configurations. It can transfer grasp to new shapes, and then it can also interpolate between grasp and shapes. So just to give you a little bit of an idea, so let's say that we have a space uh, where on uh, these three uh, uh, corners of the triangle you have something that looks like a book, something that looks like uh, a pasta, uh, Italian pasta, I don't remember now what it's called, and then there is a bottle up there. And what you see on each of them are uh, three vectors, and these are just representing then the contacts for the three fingers that would represent a stable grasp on that object. So we, what we could do, or what we can do with this grasp moduli spaces, we can use a specific representation to continuously deform an object from one shape to another, and at the same time continuously find uh, three-fingered stable grasp, grasps on a new shape. So by building a space like that, what we, could, uh, what we can basically do is then to transfer the knowledge of grasp stability between different shapes of objects or between, uh, in the same uh, shape, different types of uh, grasps. Um, why is this interesting? Well, it's interesting because it also offers a way, this space offers uh, um, a, um, uh, a way also learning other aspects that are relevant for um, uh, finding or estimating grasp stability. So for example, if we would like to uh, consider uh, a robot that washes dishes, what will happen is that the friction coefficients change while the task is ongoing, right? So uh, we go from uh, dry objects to wet objects and back to dry objects and so on. And if you think about the uh, classical stability conditions, these will change when the friction change. So one way into looking into this problem of how we can address uh, different frictions, this is also a nice space which can be then used to address problem like that. So um, absolutely not everything that we do with our hands uh, also considers uh, solely, uh, let's say, grasps. We use our hands also as hooks. We lift objects, we drag them, and so on. So um, this brings me then to the um, uh, problem of start uh, talking about caging. So uh, why caging is interesting? I it's interesting because um, it offers, um, as I call them, loose interactions with objects. So there is a control uh, over the object. The robot can do something with that object, it can um, still lift it, move it from A to B, and so on. Uh, but the fact that uh, it does not have a firm grasp of it 
it gives it gives it gives it gives this, it gives the robot possibility to actually uh, vary the type of interaction it has with the object. So in the case of two nows, uh, they will be able to carry a box in a more flexible manner when they do it through putting the hands through the uh, opening rather than actually uh, applying stable grasp on them, grasps on them. So uh, how do we address caging and what is our current work uh, uh, doing? So um, motivated by some work in the also computer vision community, we would like to look into different categories of objects. And of course we want to address this uh, or we address this in 3D. So our early work has looked into uh, generating cages on objects that uh, had holes where we could then, um, as I have just shown, uh, for example, drag an arm through a hole and uh, make an interaction with an object in that way. Uh, the more recent work uh, is looking into 3D objects and uh, graph theory and looks into how we could then generate 3D cages, save 3D cages, on objects that have uh, not holes but some other properties that we actually call forks and necks. So the whole work lies on then uh, the use of algebraic topology where we uh, see uh, or use a graph uh, extension or graph, re graph representation of an object and then use so-called linking number between a loop and then this augmented graph uh, of an object to actually prove whether there is a 3D cage between the object and the manipulator. Now when we talk about uh, objects with necks, uh, the topological aspect of it is then uh, based, it's based on the linking relation between the two curves, where one curve then represents the neck of the, the, the represents the object with its extended representation, and the other, the red curve, is then representing, uh, um, um, let's say, a um, robot manipulator or a tool that a robot is using for uh, performing caging. Uh, we do this also for more complex objects, and uh, we call this objects, um, well, or we use the notion of forks, so embed more complex skeletons in shapes where um, that's necessary and also use this topologically geometric perspective to prove that there is a cage, that there exists a safe cage around object um, uh, like that. Now, uh, we haven't published that yet, so for those that are interested in 3D caging and would like to look uh, or read about the proofs, we are soon going to have this um, uh, archived or you can email me if you would like to uh, see how we deal with the proof. So these are just some of the examples of the cages uh, that uh, we generate on these different types of objects. It's a little bit uh, difficult to see, but there is a loop around a neck uh, at the objects where these are detected. Now, why this is interesting is that all of a sudden we can start to talk about uh, grasping or caging of deformable objects or using also deformable tools such as uh, ropes uh, to actually achieve cages around the objects. Now how we do that or how we can then use different types of control algorithms uh, to, to generate cages, we have shown that uh, previously uh, on objects that actually exhibit loops and uh, for those interested you can actually find it so some ideas uh, in this paper where we demonstrated uh, uh, what we called uh, clasping, latching, hooking with different types of manipulators on objects that exhibit uh, loop-like structures. And uh, the first examples that I showed these are just the real results then of uh, generating uh, such cages. Um, more recent thing also that, um, and what I think a problem that does not uh, deserve too much attention in the community, is so-called in-hand grasp adaptation. Now I have um, really only one slide here, a number of uh, references and I will try to explain uh, uh, the bits and pieces of the system that we have developed. Now the idea here is that if we want to do in-hand grasp uh, adaptations, if we want to uh, improve 
uh, an initial grasp that has been made on an object, not much can be done if we have um, achieved a power grasp with an object, okay? We have a safe grasp, but that grasp is not so much um, adaptive or flexible from the point of view of changing the position or the pose of the object in the hand. In order to be able to do that, we need uh, um, to develop algorithms or uh, fingertip for fingertip grasping. And uh, this is what we did. So uh, we'll now look into how we can achieve uh, three, four fingered grasps on objects where we can, in the representation of the object, now again, this idea of having the same representation space for, uh, let's say, uh, object and uh, grasps, uh, the, where the geometry of the fingertips is also included in the representation uh, of the object. So we can look into what parts of the objects afford uh, contacts with specific fingers or hands. Uh, in order to be able uh, to plan the grasps, we have uh, defined a, a graph-like representation or a hierarchy where um, different parts of objects relate in different ways in order to be able to, in a fast way, search uh, for stable grasps uh, on, uh, on a given object. Now, once the, so in the pre-grasping stage, everything is about um, object representation and grasp planning. In the grasping stage, uh, then the, uh, the, the, the best or the chosen grasp is um, achieved, and then the tactile feedback can be used, again, to give some notion about how stable that grasp is. And now in this stage, there are two things that we could do. Uh, we could either, uh, use uh, uh, the control algorithm that allows us to uh, control the, the force that is applied on, the ob on an object. So if it is detected that, uh, that there is an external disturbance on an object, or uh, whether uh, slippage is detected, or if there is some other reason for trying to improve the grasp, uh, we can first use the first controller that actually squeezes the, uh, the object harder and then uh, achieves a more stable grasp by higher force. Now when that's not enough, or if the robot interacts with the object that um, is uh, deformable for some reason, then we uh, have another controller that actually um, uh, implements so-called um, uh, finger gating or regrasping. So I just wanted to show uh, a couple of examples and uh, drive you through those to show you uh, the basic idea. So um, the, the, the robot has grasped an object and it has a three-fingered grasp on the object and what it happens is that it starts to feel that the weight of the object changes. So what you see uh, and it does that through the tactile feedback. So what it does, it starts to squeeze more. And uh, it's a little bit difficult to see now, it's easier. And uh, it's a slowed speed, uh, which you can see it's a third of the speed. So um, it squeezes more in order to counteract the change weight of the object. And then it comes the external disturbance. And then the increased force is not enough anymore. So what it happens, it moves one of the fingers to actually counteract the external forces. And this is what you will see then uh, in the next coming experiments. So it actually plans how to move the fingers in order to achieve uh, a more stable grasp. And that's not sped up, so uh, the actual representation of the object shape allows us to do this uh, pretty fast. So one of the things we are looking into right now is how to use this system not only in order to, no, not only for um, uh, counteracting the external disturbances or change weight, 
but also look into ways of uh, how finger gating can actually be used uh, with three or four fingers in order to move uh, actively the uh, uh, fingers along the object and also in that way um, achieve re-grasping that is not only locally because in this case the fingers are moving rather locally but also do a global change um, of the grasp. So um, um, the final note that I would like to make, a couple of years ago somebody said that grasping was a solved problem. So uh, I um, think in retrospective that some things we know how to do good. So if we want to plan a stable grasp and we know uh, exactly what we are grasping, yes, we can consider that as a solved problem. But grasping is also a process. It's a process that actually starts with pre-grasping. It has a grasping stage and then it has also post-grasping stage. So when we talk about grasping, we need to be prepared to actually develop systems that not only think about where to put fingers, but also how to adapt the grasp once, uh, uh, once the, the, the environment in somehow affects the pose of the object in the hand or if the robot needs to do something actively in order to achieve uh, a better grasp. So uh, one of the challenges, of course, is also to get uh, the right tactile feedback in cases like this, and uh, I think that uh, that's another challenge, so I hope that uh, in a year or two, there will be better hand and better tactile feedback that we can do even better work with. That was all, thank you. <laughs> 25 minutes and three seconds. So with all these like force feedback and other mechanisms, it looks like grasping is really only for the labs uh, because it's very expensive for like uh, people to kind of 3D print or do any of this at home. So where do you think like, how do you think it will get like democratized where anybody will be able to like experiment with different grasping at home? Like what would be some of the ways in which we can extend it and make it available for the general public? Um, yes, I completely agree. The sensors are pretty expensive and they also very easily break. So I think that uh, the technology in terms of hands and um, uh, sensory feedback on hands is not mature enough for us to address uh, difficult, um, let's say, you know, very dexterous uh, in-hand manipulation and uh, compare robots to humans. I, I, I don't think just that the hardware is there yet. Uh, however, there are still many problems that uh, I don't think um, people are working enough on. And uh, one problem is task-related grasping. So how do we grasp objects in order for the grasp to afford a specific task that the robot is supposed to do uh, with, uh, with, the, uh, with the object? And I think that in that case, um, um, the probabilistic models and uh, planning, uh, the work on that can still be you know, extended and done better. Another thing is uh, dual arm <coughs> manipulation. So if there are not enough fingers, I think that uh, two hands uh, can be used in order to do some of these tasks, right? So lots of, let's say, um, uh, potentially re-grasping or even if uh, the object starts to uh, slide in the hand, if robot has two hands, it can actually use the second hand to, to um, for the help. So I think that uh, that's also uh, a topic that I would like to see much more work on. And in a similar way, do you think like the KUKA, like the arm itself, like uh, are we reaching a stage wherein we can have 3D printed just the arm, not the, I'm not touching even the touch, but just the arm can perform most of the tasks that are required. Uh, are we at that stage with the just the hand? Because this has torque sensors and other things, right? So without those sensors, just with current or EMF feedback will be, be able to grasp and do useful things? Well, I think, I think that ha uh, arms are also important. I think that the fact that we have six or seven degrees of freedom arms also makes the grasping problem simpler.
but it does not solve it. So I think that uh, if we work just with three degrees of freedom arms or something like that, I mean, it would make grasping problem even more difficult. So I think that the interesting thing is how do we use um, uh, full body motion also, especially in the case of humanoid robots in order, and, and for um, uh, applications, human robot collaboration, especially there we can actually use the full body motion rather than also only arms. So I think it's really important to use all the available degrees of freedom and not constrain on only few. Very nice. Uh, about caging, uh, how complex object can you handle? Because, for example, if you have a ball with a lot of kind of points, where the points are, are you know, you don't have enough clearance to grasp. So mm -hmm. you can have topology which are very strange, which are you don't find very often. But h could you say something about it? Yes. So um, um, we only scratch the surface on that and uh, look into. We are trying to find natural categories of objects for which can maybe topologies be, be defined in a little bit different ways. So right now, I mean, a bunny or a bear that I have showed, I mean, uh, it's not very complex, but uh, we think very much about like search and rescue applications. So let's say that two robots would need to drag a human or something like that. So where is the best way uh, or part of the body to actually put a rope around a human and thing, things like that. So um, I think that there is the value of actually looking into caging also for objects like human body that are deformable, right? So if we can say that we can preserve a certain type of graph-like representation, so even if the body can move in different directions, there will be some form of a basic graph that is preserved and that's why we are interested in caging. But I completely agree with you that there will be very complex shapes for which, you know, this necks and forks that we are talking about are not valid. Uh, but the same problem we have with grasping. Hmm? Hmm? Thank you.